go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and turn my uh, camera off so we can preserve some bandwidth here. But I just wanted you to see I am a real person. And Dale Sean McLean is with us as well as uh, Alexis Briley. She's in actually sitting here in my office with me. And all three of us will be available to answer questions at the very end. So uh, let me first of all just uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate in, in your community week uh, for healthcare science and research. Uh, let me just say one, one or two sentences about BioNetwork. We, we are in the community college system to provide economic and workforce uh, development for biotechnology and life science industries throughout the state of North Carolina. We educate, we train, uh, we have laboratory resources uh, in some of our facilities throughout the state that companies can actually use. Uh, we're organized into three different divisions. Uh, the three of us actually work for the industry training division where we actually train people who go to work in life science companies all across the state of North Carolina in laboratory work, manufacturing, whatever uh, products are uh, made that are, that are useful for people in regulated industries. We have an engagement division that does a lot of STEM outreach to middle schools and high schools. And we also have a, a media development group that creates a lot of e-learning resources. Uh, and they're actually located down in the Charlotte area. Okay, I'm trying to advance my slide. Let's see, here we go. Uh, I have my contact information here just in case you wanna reach out to me. I'll put all three of our contact information up at the end as well. Uh, I've been with BioNetwork since 2004. I've been in instruction since 2004. I haven't worked in the lab um, since that since before then when I worked in industry, but we have Dale Sean and Alexis here that, who have done that, and they'll be here to, to give you some more recent laboratory information regarding some of the careers related to lab work and life sciences. So um, careers with working in the laboratory can be very numerous. I've I've listed a few here and I'll I'll just talk about them uh, briefly. Working in lab settings, it's, it's a real important function to life science companies, but it could also be used in uh, research institution, uh, institutions as well. And it doesn't matter whether you're a lab analyst that is just simply uh, testing the materials that are being used in uh, various aspects of the laboratory. Uh, you might be a, a, a technician working in a chem chemical lab performing various chemical analyses. Uh, you might even be a, a technician working in a, bi a biology lab that is involved in cell culture or gene therapy. That is one of uh, Alexis's uh, big things that she uh, does and that she, one of her areas of interest. You could even be a scientist with a a baccalaureate degree or a master's degree or PhD working in research or drug discovery. Yes, even with uh, advanced degrees like that, you're, you're still involved in laboratory work. Uh, you could be a microbiologist that, that studies the organisms that are used for good in our industry. Many of my uh, microorganisms are used in fermentation processes to uh, produce medicines that we use today. Or you might uh, be a microbiologist that studies the contaminants that are coming from unwanted sources uh, and be involved in more contamination control activities uh, within the life science in industry. You might be a, a technician who prepares solutions for conducting laboratory activities or experiments, or maybe even these solutions that can be used on various instruments that are necessary in the uh, uh, generation of data that's used to make decisions about the um, medicines that might be uh, made in this industry. Uh, this, this seems like something that's not very important, but it's probably one of the most important parts of being in a laboratory. It, it's in, essential that we have clean glassware, clean instruments, clean equipment. Uh, and in some cases, it has to be disinfected and sterilized as well. And uh, we call those uh, technicians, uh, a lot of times just simply refer to them as glassware technicians, but they play a, a very important role. And then you can be involved in uh, some aspects of the laboratory, 
such as Dale Shawn is now and uh, Alexis was at one point in, uh, in time in her career, uh, managing the entire laboratory operations. It can be fun, it can be rewarding, and it can be exciting all at the same time. The work that you do in the laboratory is an essential part in many cases for proving or disproving various hypotheses. Uh, and it, it'll help lead to conclusions for products that can actually be life-saving in some cases. So these careers involve applying the knowledge that you gain through your education and through your training, and then you can work in these dynamic environments that provide you know, new challenges and experiences basically on a daily basis. And these positions typically pay very well uh, also. So what, what is important to consider about having a career working in a laboratory? Well, probably one of the first things we need to look at before we can work in a laboratory, you have to understand the hazards that you might be exposed to. Safety is an important part. There's many different safety considerations that need to be communicated. And then once they're communicated, they need to be followed. In fact, the FDA has this policy, we say what we do and we do what we say. So if you're working in a laboratory for a regulated company, you have to have written procedures that are followed, including for the safety, not just for the safety of you, but the safety of the product that you might be working with. Compliance is essential for safety. Working in laboratories uh, typically involves great care, following those written safety procedures and guidelines to help ensure that you and your coworkers are not harmed in any way. So we have chemical hazards. They can exist in many different forms. Some can be reactive with each other, with body tissues. You probably have heard this before. Some can be flammable and even explosive. And, and some can cause some long-term harm in the form of things like neurotoxins or, uh, or carcinogens or mutagens or teratogens, and there's others. So the written procedures on how we handle and store these chemicals have to be in place. And you as a laboratory worker must follow those procedures. Proper cleanup and disposal is another important part of working in chemical laboratories as well. Communication about the hazards that laboratory associates are gonna be exposed to are the most important preventative major, measures that laboratory management must have in place to protect you as a worker in the lab. Some laboratories have some significant biological hazards as well. And some of those biological hazards have significant, can cause significant illnesses. If you're exposed in an unsafe manner to uh, a biological hazard, it, it could adversely impact the human body. So frequently in the laboratory, we have to have some special containment needs that are employed to prevent the biological hazards from adversely impacting the safety and health of, of the staff within the lab. There's considerations for proper cleanup, disinfection, and disposal of these types of hazards that exist too. And they exist in writing because there are laws that govern what we can and cannot do in the laboratory. So working in the laboratory involves a lot of compliant behavior. Then there's the physical hazards. They have to be addressed in laboratories as well broken glass, possible misuse of water in the presence of electricity, for instance, slips and falls, burns from flames. There are so many of these that can re uh, wreak havoc in our laboratories that we need to uh, make sure that we consider. No one wants to have to deal with accidents. I'm sure that, that uh, most of us want to work in a safe environment. It should go without saying that prevention of accidents is always what people prefer. So OSHA, O-S-H-A, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, is the governing regulatory agency that regulates how all workplaces, including laboratories, operate with safety in mind. So how do we do this? How do we prevent accidents from happening? Well, the most important way we do this is through communication. And if you're working in a laboratory, you have to be uh, open and accessible to every form of communication possible to prevent these accidents. The National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA, actually has this symbol. You may have seen it on the side of buildings 
where there's laboratories or other manufacturing facilities. If this is a primary means of communicating hazards within that workplace, including the laboratories, safety hazards that exist in facilities. Now the NFPA diamond is what it's commonly called. It's a very effective way to communicate facility hazards. Now here you see the explanations on the, the four corners of the, the diamond. The health hazard is in blue, fire hazard in red, uh, stability hazards in yellow, and in the white are some very specific hazards with some abbreviations about some of the chemicals that may be uh, present in your facilities. Keeping in mind, the facilities include our laboratory facilities too. Another way we prevent accidents is by having the appropriate personal protective equipment. We typically call this PPE. Employers have the responsibility to provide you in the laboratory with the right tools to be able to perform your tasks safely. But employees also have responsibility to wear what is provided for, for the safe laboratory work to protect, in many cases, the product as well. So you see these, the, this uh, illustration here where you see the gloves and the boots and the goggles and the safety glasses and the face masks. Not every facility requires every one of these. If the hazards in the laboratory exist where those would be necessary, then you would wear those. There's also facility controls that are used in laboratories as well. Now, traditional laboratory safety guidelines have usually emphasized the use of your work practices as well. Appropriate containment equipment though, and well-designed facilities and administrative controls all working together will minimize the risks of unintentional infection or injury for laboratory workers and it helps prevent contamination of your outside environment as well. Uh, when we design laboratory facilities, and I have been involved in designing numerous through my uh, lengthy career, um, we always have to consider, take great care to consider safety first. Everything is about making sure that we operate safety. Safety equipment such as drenching showers, which are very common in labs uh, for, for handling spills and particularly spills on us, fire blankets, fire extinguishers, have to be in place. We have to have the right uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems in place for proper ventilation. All those things need to be considered for the workers who will be working in a laboratory. Fume hoods, biological safety cabinets, sometimes they're installed, and, and the placement of the equipment and the utilities all has to be considered so that we design it to prevent mix-ups, cross-contamination, and accidents from happening. Every aspect minimizes risk. We even have environmental controls that are part of what we put into our laboratory as well. Uh, they're built into facilities to protect not only the experiments that we're working on, but also the workers within our facilities. Some cases they're designed to contain work in facilities that might be uh, po uh, potentially hazardous. When we're working with uh, various classifications of microorganisms, for example, uh, there's uh, various classifications of uh, safety that we need to consider and containment so that it doesn't get exposed into the outside environment. And another one of the more important ways we prevent accidents and, and promote safety in the laboratory is through our training. It's one of the reasons why we're in business is to make sure people are trained properly to do what they're expected to do in manufacturing environments and also in the laboratory. They're one of the most critical and sometimes one of the least stressed uh, activities, and, and that's training. The training received by individuals who work in those labs goes a long way, not only in the lab you're working in, but throughout your entire career. Training concepts, for instance, in bloodborne pathogens or agent-specific training, whatever the organisms you might be working with, uh, and even the use of some of the proactive and reactive safety equipment and how that is effectively used to prevent accidents uh, occurs as part of our training. If an accident occurs, there's usually very little time to react to prevent potentially catastrophic events from occurring. If we have the proper training, 
then those are less likely to uh, occur. All right, let's talk about some of our laboratory instrumentation. This just happens to be a photograph of a top loading autoclave, very common, but it's also uh, one of those things that's involved with safety. So along with safety, the equipment or the instrumentation that is used in laboratories is highly specific and it's very technical in nature. And that's really one of the cool things about working in uh, environments where we have uh, laboratories. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I forgot to turn off my phone. Uh, knowing how to safely operate the equipment and to maximize it to your benefit can also be a challenge and it can be fun at times too. But we always need to keep in mind that the equipment is designed to benefit the work that we do. So we have to treat it with respect and care in the laboratory as, as well. Learning the proper operation of the equipment as well as proper care of our equipment can assist us in generating results that will allow us to further enhance the work that we do in the laboratories. This equipment is expensive, so we need to treat it well so it will be able to work for us. Proper operation and calibration of instrumentation is also essential so that the results that we get from that equipment or the data that we generate for our work objectives is meaningful and reliable. You have to consider that a lot of times when the work that we're doing in labs it is going to potentially impact somebody's lives. People's lives can one day depend on what we do with the equipment that we use in the laboratory on a daily basis. So we have to use it with care and we have to use it the right way. If we place our equipment into laboratories in a well-organized fashion, that will help in the streamlining of our activities and will help us prevent our, uh, having mix-ups as well. Deviations that occur because of clutter, poorly maintained laboratories and unsafe facilities will put our work and our workers, our co-workers at risk. And we don't want to do that. The instrumentation in laboratory spaces that is well cared for makes our workflow more efficient. It makes our employees more productive and it produces results that we can use to make business decisions that can be life-changing for people all around the world. So let's talk about some of the activities that are performed in the laboratory. Uh, I want to talk about wet lab work, probably one of the most common things that people do in laboratories. Wet laboratory space types are defined as laboratories where chemicals, drugs, and other materials, including biological materials, are tested and analyzed, requiring water, ventilation, specialized pipe utilities, and so on. Wet lab spaces uh, do not include biohazard levels that are really significantly hazardous, things like biosafety level two, three, and four, as defined by the NIH or CDC guidelines. Now, cl classical wet chemical analysis is what we traditionally expect to be performed in wet lab work. But there could be laboratories designed for cell culture. A lot of people call this upstream. Cell culture is a process where Cells are grown under very controlled conditions, generally outside of their natural environment. And then after these cells of interest have been isolated from living tissue, they can be uh, maintained under carefully controlled conditions. And these conditions vary depending on the cell type you're working with, but generally consist of a suitable vessel or some uh, substrate or something that will, the, the um, uh, Cells will reside in something maybe rich in amino acids or carbohydrates or vitamins or minerals or something. They might have an addition of growth factors, hormones, various gases such as carbon dioxide and oxygen. And we have to regulate the physiochemical environment, if you will, the pH, osmotic pressure, and temperature in many cases for these cells so that they can grow and then we can manufacture products from those products that we're, we're culturing in our, uh, in our upstream processes. Then we have upstream, excuse me, the uh, downstream, the purification side. So if the purpose of your cell culture is for protein purification, a large part of your day is likely spent doing some laboratory work such as filtering, 
purifying the product and concentrating proteins. Fun stuff. It really is fun. These steps are challenging though because proteins can be easily degraded. They can precipitate. Uh, they can be lost at any step uh, during the purification process. And our goal is to maximize the amount of product that we can uh, culture and retain so that ultimately we can, as a company, make a profit. So chromatography is another laboratory technique that you will typically see performed in laboratories. It's a common purification method for analysis of analytes that are uh, present in a solution. This is polymerase chain reaction. A lot of you may know this is PCR. Uh, we sometimes call this molecular photocopying, but the PCR is a fast, inexpensive, inexpensive excuse me, technique that we use to amplify or copy small segments of DNA, one of the things that Alexis likes to do. Because significant amounts of samples of DNA are necessary for us in, in molecular and genetic analysis, we have to be able to, to uh, grow it, if you will, amplify it, make it so that we can actually manipulate it in a, in a laboratory setting. It's also valuable in a number of other laboratory and clinical techniques too, like things like DNA fingerprinting or detection of bacteria and viruses, things like the, the, the detection of the AIDS virus and other uh, genetic types of disorders. And I won't go into a lot more of these, but one of the more recent ones that we've looked at is viral culture work. It's a laboratory technique where samples of viruses are placed in different cell lines where the virus being tested um, is being tested for its ability to infect. Um, we did a lot of this uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus that caused the COVID-19 pandemic that we're hopefully coming out of right now. It's isolated in a laboratory and it's available for research by sci the scientific and medical community. And of course, we know that it was really important to understand this for our vaccine production. Specimen processing is another foundational principle for laboratory test procedures. And the, the value of that test is, if that value of that test is compromised or even negated using specimens that haven't been properly collected or labeled or stored properly, then we're, we're not gonna have good results. The types of biological samples that are accepted in most clinical laboratories are things like serum, uh, virology, swab samples, biopsies, necropsies, uh, necropsy tissue, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, uh, whole blood that is used in PCR, and even urine samples. These are all collected in specific containers for successful processing in our laboratories. Another important aspect of working in the laboratory is preparing solutions. It may seem mundane, but it's important. Lab experiments and types of research oftentimes will require us to have chemical solutions used in, in various procedures. And we have to understand when we're, when we're preparing these chemical solutions, either by weight and volume or volume and volume, uh, some of those solutions require very specific pHs to be appropriate for their use. So you have to have some good techniques and some good education to be able to prepare the kinds of solutions that are used in laboratories. Technicians have to be careful and thorough in their execution of their tasks in the laboratory. And even the environment, understanding the contaminants in our environment and the, the cleanliness, contamination control might be another word for this, uh, is an important part of what we do in laboratory work. We don't want to have our samples become contaminated uh, that's going to give us uh, results that are uh, potentially not what we're expecting to see. Cell and gene therapy. Again, this is uh, for Alexis. This is her area of specialty. They're some of the newer technologies that are really exciting for laboratory workers. They're techniques uh, that I personally have not been involved in, but she has. DNA is studied and used in the medicines that are treating various diseases involving various gen genetic abnormalities. So this is all specialized work that is expanding in the research arena and production efforts throughout the state of North Carolina. 
And before, uh, and, and I'm going to start to close things out a little bit, but I want to talk about probably one of the most important areas of working in a laboratory, and that's document, documenting what we do. We document for lots of different reasons. We document because that's what good laboratory practices involves, writing down everything that we do so we can understand what we've done and have some traceability for, for uh, all the activities that we've performed. It's, if you're working in a regulated company that is regulated by the FDA, it's a requirement for GMP, good manufacturing practices. That traceability aspect is really important because we can't always remember even what we did yesterday, can we? A lot of times we can't. So the traceability is important. If we document real time what we do, there's no way that we could uh, uh, have any errors that occur uh, because we had forgotten to write something down. We document for accountability too. We need to know who did what and that's another part of what GMP is all about. We also want reproducibility. If we want to do something in a manner that is repeatable, we, we need to document it so that we can have a record of how we did it uh, in a particular way. So documentation is important. We want to document for trending purposes so that if something is going awry, we can fix it before it becomes a major problem. We want to document for protecting our intellectual property. I know many companies who have received patents on their products because they documented everything they did in the laboratory and they were able to successfully uh, achieve a patent protection. We document because someday, who knows, everything that we do becomes a legal piece of evidence and we might have to produce that one day in court. Let's hope not, but it could be. And we always want to continuously improve everything that we do. So that's another reason why we document. And we want to learn from what we do too. It helps us, uh, it's a teaching tool, it helps us learn what we do. So what does that mean for you? Good documentation practices. That means we're going to write everything down that we do on a daily basis in a laboratory notebook, on a data collection form that has been approved for us to use within our organization, Uh, we, we're going to document with batch records. If we're manufacturing product in a facility that's a GMP facility, we're going to document electronically in a lot of cases too. And there's regulations in GMP facilities for how we document uh, electronically and record that information for, for future use. So that said, I'm going to close and leave this open for question and answers with Delshawn and with Alexis. But I, I do want to say this, uh, North Carolina is growing every day. And I've been with BioNetwork since 2004. We started out in 2004 with somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 to 500 life science companies. And now look where we're sitting at around 790, almost 800 life science companies. And we're getting phone calls and emails on a daily basis from companies that want laboratory workers, that want manufacturing technicians, that want people to come and work for them all across the state of North Carolina. We're a leader in the life science hub and effective laboratory uh, workers are, are in high demand for uh, companies all across the state. So I encourage you to ask some questions. Uh, we'll be happy to take any questions that you have. I'm going to open it up for uh, Dale Sean and for Alexis to answer questions. I'm going to thank you. And while you're answering questions, I'm going to put our contact information up here and just provide you the opportunity to reach out to any of the three of us. If you'd like, we'll be happy to help. My contact information and Alexis' contact information happens to be the same. We share an office right now. But I, I welcome you to reach out to us and ask us anything that you want, either by email, telephone, or uh, just right now. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask questions, please feel free to. Thank you. Alexis. Any questions? Now, Sean? 
Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. You have you have both Dale Sean and Alexis here right now. Any questions you have? Dale Sean and, and how about you all just share how you got into the field? Okay. How did you know that that's what you wanted to do? Um, when I was in college, I uh, graduated with a bachelor's degree in biology. And um, while I was taking some classes, I was taking some chemistry classes. And one of my professors said, um, if you just, if you're not going directly to get a master's, you might want to pick up a minor in chemistry or dual major, because chemistry is where you're likely to get a job at. And he was right. I got a minor in chemistry. My first job was with the Department of Agriculture. I was a chemistry technician for a couple of years. Um, and then I started working on my master's and I was working for in public health. So I wanted to switch careers and I moved over and I've been uh, last 16 years. I've worked in the public health lab before coming to bio network. I was lead virologist where we did rabies testing, viral culture, specimen processing, PCR, measles, mumps. We did all things viruses. Um, so that's my that's my background. If you have any questions in those areas, I'm happy to answer. If I can, Alexis. Okay, um, my story is kind of similar. I um, went to school for biology and somehow got talked into doing a dual with chemistry. Um, so I double majored and did BS biology, BA chemistry. Um, I wanted to go into the genetics field. I wanted to get a job up in Raleigh and. Um, I really was trying to do research with Alzheimer's disease because it runs in my family. So it's kind of a passion of mine. Um, I love genetics and I ended up not finding a job. So I went back to get my master's and did one year of molecular biology and biotechnology um, and ended up leaving and got a job with the chemistry um, doing pharmaceutical. I was an analytical chemist at a pharmaceutical company for about three years um, until recently I got this job. So I'm really excited to get back to my roots and do um, develop this cell and gene therapy program. So any questions? What is one thing that you wish you would have known? So thinking about all your experiences, undergrad, grad, even your first job, what were some things that as a freshman, sophomore, junior that you wish you would have known that you know now? Good question. <laughs> For me, I didn't realize people in undergrad did research labs. You didn't have to be in a master's or PhD program to get in. Um, a lot of um, professors that have grants will take undergrads for free for training and you get experience hands-on, um, which is what the industry really wants is hands-on experience, not just your education, which is why we're now offering this program. So um, yeah, I would say if you, if you want to get into the industry, any type of research lab will get you hands-on experience and at least give you a feel for maybe something you want to or realize you don't want to do before you get into the industry? I guess if, if I had to do it, I, I, rem, I remember taking a biotechnics class in college and I didn't realize how um, far that would come along. Now molecular is leading the way um, with sequencing and all these different things. Um, I used to do, we used to do viral culture, um, a herpes viral culture that would once we inoculated the sample, it would be seven days until negative. Um, we recently enacted a PCR test before I left and we got results, herpes results in um, 30 minutes with PCR. So you went from seven days to knowing whether or not you have herpes to 30 minutes, half an hour. That's because molecular techniques and molecular biology and all these things are just advancing so quickly. Um, that's definitely a field that, to look into if you're in college, yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah, sure. Could we'll be able to still get hands-on training even after we graduated? You can. Um, 
a lot of times employers will offer hands-on training on once you get to the job position. That's what would happen for me in the pharmaceutical role I was in. Um, I got trained for all the instruments on the job. Um, it was gradual. It wasn't like I learned everything in the first week I got there. It was a progression. Um, but also they utilize us by a network for training programs so that you get that hands-on experience before stepping foot into their facility. I can say that um, my first job interview um, for a chemistry technician, a lot of the things I learned in college labs helped me to land that job. Um, a lot, some of the things we actually did in, in some of the labs in college, they were asking about for on the interview. And um, so I think pay attention to that. And also like Alexis said, on the job training, um, they, they don't expect you to know everything. If you have a basic understanding, then they're able to teach you everything else you need to know. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to add a little bit too to what, what both Delshawn and Alexis said. A lot of times we look at this as a chicken and the egg kind of a thing, which comes first. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of companies it, uh, would like to have you experienced uh, when they hire you to come and work for them, but how do you get that experience unless you're already working? Uh, and so one of the things I will encourage you to do is uh, try to beef up your research skills while you're still in school, if at all possible. I know that I, I uh, serve on a biological safety committee for an institution here in North Carolina, and there's a lot of students who work for researchers at uh, some of the laboratory uh, places where they uh, conduct their research, and they're getting that experience while they're still in school. Uh, and that's a good way to, of doing that, but one of the things I can tell you too, a lot more companies today are finding that the only way that uh, they can get a, a trained workforce is to have people come in and have them train them in their way and how they want things done. And that's, that's just, you know, that on the job training is one of those uh, potentials that seems to be growing within the industries around North Carolina. Like Alexis said, you know, getting uh, into a research institution is ideal prior to going out and working into industry. But if that's not possible, uh, you, you know, sell yourself to a company and maybe that company will provide you with some uh, opportunities, entry level opportunities to get your uh, feet wet and learn some of the techniques and things that you need to, to learn to be able to be effective on the job. Um, with these like entry level positions, we can like find something like that in like hospitals or in clinics. Right, where there's more patient contact uh, and, and things that have to be done right away for, uh, you know, for, for health considerations for patients, they, they typically uh, prefer somebody with some more experience, but that doesn't mean that you're not gonna be able to get some entry level positions. It may start out as a technician before you become an analyst and then before you become a supervisor or something like that, but that they are available, not so much where, uh, as I mentioned, in healthcare facilities where there's patient contact. But uh, I, I would urge you also to consider laboratories with pharmaceutical companies, with biotech companies, uh, even with uh, cosmetic and food companies. The, I've, I've done training for cosmetic companies and they have chemical analysts that uh, are very highly skilled in a lot of different techniques that work for the cosmetic industry, believe it or not. So uh, food companies even, um, even going to work for some government agencies like uh, the Environmental Protection Agency or um, you know, some of the, uh, the, the food regulators, things like that would be helpful. We have a facility in Raleigh at NC State's campus, our Capstone Center, where you can get some hands-on very specific training uh, and you're welcome to reach out to us and we can tell you how to do that. Dale Sean actually uh, is stationed at that particular facility. So, you know, we can help you uh, get connected with some of the various types of training that, that is offered. So you can get those skills. Okay. I don't know if we answered your question adequately. We, we tried. Um, you did. Thank you. Uh -huh. 
And I did want to point out in the chat, I did put it, we have the Office of Undergraduate Research here at UNC Charlotte. So that would be an amazing way to start getting some research while you're here at UNC Charlotte. Dr. Erin Banks is over that program. She would be an amazing person to connect with if you're wanting to explore some of those, those resources. But I did, like I said, put that link in the chat. Yeah, I didn't have that contact information like you just presented, but I, I hear it's a great program. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yep. So we do have another question from Gary. It says, what aspects of your position do you enjoy most and what aspects of your role do you enjoy least? I'll just say I love teaching. Uh, I mean, it's always been a passion of mine. Um, I, I, even when I worked in industry, I was a trainer. Uh, my, my background is in both biology and chemistry as well. And, uh, but I've in teaching's been some of the, the most fun I've had. Now, I loved working in a lab. I love doing drug discovery, and I did that for a long time. But teaching is more fulfilling for me. Alexis? Um, so I won't talk about my position here at BioNetwork. I just started this week, so I haven't done any teaching yet. But I'll speak on the lab, um, the analytical chemist role I had for three years. Um, that was in the laboratory every single day. HPLC machines every single day of uh, like he was talking wet chemistry um, that I really enjoy if you like working independently lab is for you um, you do all your stuff yourself um, I like that the most because I am very much an independent person and like to do things on my time reasonable time and you know the thing that I didn't like the least was <laughs> documentation, <laughs> documentation. Okay. The, the most important part. The most important part. <laughs> it is, it can be very tedious because there's so many rules, but I mean, it's GMP FDA regulated. So you have to be, I mean, it's just something you have, you, you get used to it, but um just make sure you write down every single thing you do. That's my best advice. <laughs> yeah, Sean, how about you? Um, I'm, I'm fairly new in the laboratory coordinator uh, position as well. Just started in January. Um, I work with a great group of people and coming up with, um, we're doing sort of a restructuring now at the Capstone Center. So being a part of the ground building of that is uh, exciting. Um, when I was in the lab, I enjoyed, um, uh, just, I enjoyed viral culture, PCR, that type of thing, but also just dealing with our clients, uh, working for the state lab when people will call up and, and you can help them with something. And that, that was, I just had a good feeling about that. So, yeah. Yeah, well, Sean's helping make sure that from a safety perspective, our laboratories are, uh, are top notch as well. So, any other questions? Um, I have one more. Sure. Um, are these programs also available if you're like an alumni? An alumni of your school? Yes. We, we can put you in touch with folks. Um, it doesn't matter where you, you've graduated from. Uh, most of the time it's high school graduates or higher, but we also do open enrollment courses where you can actually take some courses. Obviously, you have to pay for the for those particular courses. But if, um, if you're not working for a specific company that's paying for it for you, but uh, we have those opportunities available. Uh, and if you'll just contact either myself uh, or Dale Sean, we're the, probably the ones that would be most familiar. And I've been around the longest. You're welcome to, to just shoot me an email and I'll send you some information. We also have a website. It's just ncbionetwork.org, just like our email address. And you can see a, a, a whole list of uh, menu uh, items of coursework that we offer. I've overwhelmed Alexis with all the courses that, that we have uh, this past week, just trying to uh, orient her to all the things that we currently have so that she knows what she needs to fill in fill it, the gaps with. Uh, in the coursework, and we've developed, uh, we've determined that the development of cell and gene, uh, cell therapy and gene therapy courses is where we're lacking. So that's what she's doing to help us out. 
I have one quick thing to add that could be an option for you. I'm not sure what medical schools are near you, but a lot of times you can go on their career part of their site and they have research assistant opportunities. Um, they are in labs that are typically, um, they know you don't have much experience. They're entry level positions. So that's one option you can try to do. That's something that I looked into in my area. So just an idea. Yeah, I, I know some technicians that had associate degree, uh, associate degrees from some of the community colleges that went to work for companies and went to work for researchers at local institutions where there were medical schools uh, nearby. And they started out as something like a glassware technician or solutions prep technician. And now they're uh, full-fledged uh, PIs on research projects. So it's possible to get those opportunities, but most of the time you're gonna start at an entry level position. And of course, the more education you have, probably the faster you advance and uh, a little bit higher up the, the, the chain that you'll start. But um, it's fun. It is so much fun working in a laboratory. Um, it's 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 really worth it. And, and I'm assuming that uh, you're on here because there's uh, something you want to learn about how you could advance your career. And I can just say this: the 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 possibilities are endless in this field. And working in laboratories, as I mentioned, is just so much fun. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Well, thank you, Greg, Delshawn, Alexis, so much for being here. Thank you for students, for y'all being here, asking some great questions. Um, uh, you've got the contact info, so I appreciate y'all being so open to students connecting with you. That's amazing. So what a great resource. So students, feel free to take a screenshot, take a photo of their contact info, reach out to them. Clearly, they're excited to be able to help you however they can. So thank you again so much for being here. And um, we do have our panel with Novant. So if you're curious about wanting to learn about what it's like to work in a hospital, um, we uh, the panel is for nursing, but it's a good way to just start networking if you're thinking you might want to start to work with a hospital. Um, so I put the link in the chat. So we've got that panel that's starting at three. So feel free to join in. That's virtually and in person at the Career Center. And um, we also have our PT school panel tomorrow at 11 a.m. So thank you all again so, so much for, sh for sharing, for being here today. And I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, too. Thank you, Stephanie. We appreciate the opportunity thank, to be here. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for great questions, too. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.